and welcome to our conference call, Filler Up, the Alert Program, and Language Levels. Uh, I'm joined today by my colleague and friend, Marcy Laurel. Welcome, Marcy. Thank you. All right. And many of you have already had the pleasure of hearing Marcy speak before. Uh, Marcy is a speech and language pathologist with the University of New Mexico's Center for Development and Disability Autism Program. She's uh, had the opportunity to do presentations around the country, internationally, related to sensory processing, communication, family issues, autism spectrum disorders. You've got a long list here. You must know a few things here, Marcy. I hope and, a few. <laughs> and I, I always appreciate the chance to share, and Marcy definitely appreciates the chance to share with ideas with communities. You're such an incredible, connected lecturer that way, and I feel privileged to have you here. Thank you. She also has the perspective of being a parent of two children with some sensory processing challenges, so she knows from where she speaks. <laughs> Uh, Marcy has so many wonderful accomplishments and wears so many hats that I'll include a full bio with the resource list that you'll be getting uh, after the call here or those of you that when you, if you're listening to this in the recorded version uh, in the future why you'll already have that. So I'll have the full bio in there so you can get the full effect of all her wonderful experience but no worries there. So um, I am going to start, sometimes I do a little sound effect but this time I felt like a quote seemed incredibly appropriate as Absolutely. we talked about language levels. Although I did think about doing like the song, talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. <laughs> that but, would have been uh, good too. I know, but, uh, the, but then there's copyright issues, and my version is so poor that then we don't have to worry about any copyright. No one would want to claim that. So the, this is a quote from uh, the NIH website, and you'll get that web link in, again in your resource document. And it talks about the importance of self-regulation, language, and learning, which, of course, uh, the interconnectedness there is not a, a great stretch by any means. So uh, here's the quote. It says, learning occurs through a process of engagement and participation in a relationship with a caring and trusted other who models the process of and provides opportunities for self-directed learning. In acquiring the capacity for self-regulated learning, social-emotional skills that foster the relationship and executive function skills that promote self-regulation, they are quite literally the foundational pieces of learning. So uh, that seems like a good way to start, because why are we talking about alert program self-regulation language, all the whole ball of wax, here we are. So that's a little bit about the why. We have uh, two calls, for those of you that haven't been on the calls before with us, kind of our goal, because we only have the 30-minute kind of time frame here, so we try to dig in and, uh, and, and get through as much as we can that hopefully will be meaningful to you all. Uh, we, first of all, our big emphasis is to keep it simple, that we've found that often when we try to do too much uh, at once, uh, then it makes it impossible to actually follow through. So that's where your permission and validation to go at things gradually, pick a piece or two that feel manageable, try those, get some success under your belt, and then go for more. And then that leads into our second thing, which is basically to set folks up for success, ourselves as well as our clients and our family members, everybody. That's a huge emphasis for Mary Sue, for Marcy and me uh, through all of our work as therapists and then especially, obviously, for Mary Sue and me uh, and, uh, and, and Marcy's participation in a lot of the ALERT program work over the decades. So really remembering that we get our best selves, we get our best product in ourselves and in the others that we care about, live with, work with, when we set them up to be successful for the task that we're wanting to do. I know that seems a little duh, but we'll, we'll kind of just uh, go at it there. So um, I want to remind everybody on the call that you'll receive an email document with your links and your references to the resources that we mentioned during the call. So don't get stressed or worry about writing and scrambling to write things down as we talk about them. You'll get the information and have it, uh, so no worries there. Um, let's see. So we'll just kind of dive right in. One of the things that um, we always try to remind ourselves as therapists anyway and those who use the How Does Your Engine Run Alert Program materials is that obviously our engine levels affect the quality of our language levels. And uh, so, again, that's not uh, earth-shattering news to anybody, but it's a worthwhile precaution so that when we're not in a just right place or our individual that we're working with or living with is not in a just right place, simple and short directions, not long discussions that require a lot of processing are going to be the best way to go. And then when the individual is in just right, that's when we can have longer discussions with more content uh, put in there and, and uh, allowing more time for the individual to process and, uh, and make sense of and agree to things ahead of time. So, Marcy, uh, 
elaborate a little bit about that from your speech therapy perspective on that. Well, thanks so much for having me on the call. Excited you bet, to be you bet. Here. Um, and I know that this is something that you and Mary Sue and I have discussed a lot over the many, as you said, decades. <laughs> we were very funny. young when we started. Um, <laughs> is that because the title question is, how does your engine run, it kind of implies or might imply that the question would always be able to be answered. And we often think of answers as coming in the form of language. So sure. it's very important to remember that answers can come in a lot of different forms. So words, but also gestures, facial expressions, responses to direction, and especially actions. So we nice. have to be able to listen carefully to what a child's telling us, and that listening takes the form of watching and noticing. And what we also have to remember is some of our kids that have sensory processing challenges, and especially kids that have autism spectrum disorders, really are limited in how much they can show us with their gestures and show us with their faces. So it means we have to watch very, very closely. And and then that makes sense. Just being extra vigilant to noticing what has what shows us where they are with what we're trying to communicate. Them. Exactly, and really learning what those cues are, even if the cues are a little bit limited and sure. how close they come out to us. And then we also have to be aware that the child's engine level is going to totally affect how easily they can use communication skills that they have. So they might be a talker, but when they're in um, overload or when they're just in a high engine place, it might be really hard for them to find those words. Or when they're in a low engine place, it might be really hard for them to find those words in a different way. So, sure. for example, just thinking of ourselves in a moment of overload, like probably this doesn't happen to many people, but if you're trying <laughs> to get dinner and help with homework all at the same time, sometimes you find there's a moment when you can't understand what anyone's saying to you anymore or you can't express what you want to say, which might be that you just want everybody to be quiet. So <laughs> it's finding our words when we're way in overload or it's finding our words when we're just in that low place and it's hard to think of the words we want to say, we want to be paying attention to that so we can be intervening at the just right level. Absolutely, and that's such a nice example because we all have felt that. We all know when we're not in our uh, best moment and how challenging it is, even though if someone were to analyze it, would say, well, Sherry, what was the problem? You were just right. you just needed to move the pan from here to here or turn the burner off or help with the problem or the homework problem or whatever. So. Um, great. So thank you for that, and, and that especially that reminder for the, for those of our uh, individuals that don't have have words yet that we want to really look at what what that answer looks like for them. Um, one of the wonderful things that I know for me as an occupational therapist that I've learned working with you and on lots of other uh, talented speech and language folks that I've had the privilege of working with uh, about language levels is looking at and being careful of because we don't really don't get training on this as occupational therapists looking at the appropriateness of the language level for the client or the child that we're working with. And can you tell us a little bit about how you all see that in your training as speech folks? Well, I'm sorry to say that as a rule, we all talk too much. And that's oh. not any one profession. That's all of us. We just tend I have to a, talk too much. And I have a quote from Irma Bombeck that kind of reinforces that. She says that, it seemed rather incongruous that in a society of super sophisticated communication, we often suffer from a shortage of listeners. Okay. And I would put myself right there in that category. I need too. that to be hanging on my wall for sure. <laughs> so language, the best way that I know how to think about this is that language should always be reciprocal or a back and forth event, always, with anybody at any level. And really this can only happen when we communicate at the child's level in any given moment. So today we're really here to think about the moments being affected by their self-regulation. Sure. So of course that moment would be influenced by self-regulation. When a child's engine is too high or too low, as we just said a moment ago, we might have to talk less or more slowly. We might have to wait longer for them to respond. Sometimes, though I kind of hesitate to say it, we might have to move more quickly with our language, but caution, caution, caution there. But for some of our little guys that are really in the slow-mo, sometimes we do have to speed up. Not that we're talking remarkably fast, but that we're making sure things happen quickly and there's novelty and things change. But as a general rule, we're more likely need to need to modify so that we're talking less, more slowly, and giving more wait time. And that makes so much sense. I know that if I, if I were to say what, there's a thought bubble over my head when I'm in treatment. One of the pieces that would have to take a, a good, strong first position there would be to remember to be quiet, Sherry, that I, uh, you know, I am, can be a little too much verbal, too, too verbal a lot of the time. And I like to joke around a lot and, and insert things quickly. And that can be so disconcerting for lots of the folks that we work with. So that's one that I have to really remind myself of is 
just be quiet, Sherry, you know? Well, and I think just listening in on this call, you can tell that Sherry and I both do like to talk really there fast. There we go. <laughs> we are perfectly comfortable Ironically. interrupting one another because that's the kind of communicators we are. So I right. think for both of us, we are especially aware and sensitive to the fact that when we walk into the treatment room or the classroom or when we're talking to somebody in their home, we got to dial it down. And I know personally I've been in trouble for talking too much my entire life. But I think <laughs> you were that destined to be a speaker. I was destined to be. But the irony of that is that right. I've really learned to be quiet through my work with children, and it's been a gift. And it's great that you bring that up, too, because it's true. We're, we're pretty comfortable with each other, and, and interrupting can be a part of this call, but it's something we agreed to beforehand. Right. It's also that both of us are talking about something that we're pretty comfortable talking about. It's not our first time talking about this kind of information. And if that were the truth, I would be really hesitant to interrupt you, but I know how well-versed you are with this, so I'm thinking, oh, okay, well, this is good. We can insert right. pieces, and it's going to be okay. And so I just thought I'd put that in there, that, of course, that's something that we talked about before we even started our call, and really remembering that we may need to consider that when we're looking at how we're interacting with our people that way. Uh, I also have to remind myself of the waiting and, and taking my time because that's more often what we, as you said, more often our caution that we have to consider because, uh, and I'm sure this is true for lots of us, is we're busy, we have schedules, we're worried about fitting in all these incredibly wonderful things that we feel we have planned in our schedule and um, it, we may or may not be able to do that. We have to look at how we have to give up some of that in order to allow processing time. and. Um, so tell us a little bit about how you describe kind of that framework or do you have any tips for us when we're in that mode and obviously we're going to be stepping back, but how do we kind of look at what, what we want to do that way? Well, this is something I've thought about for a long time and there are certain rules of thumb, okay. but I have to say in truth what I have come to believe is that it all comes down to reciprocity, which you might be starting to notice out there that is a very <laughs> obsessive interest of mine. I'm fascinated by the ways that we are back and forth in our communication sure. with other people. And um, if you, you know, were had the misfortune to be having dinner with me, you would see that I really like to talk about this a lot. But if you, um, if you strive to have a back and forth communication, meaning I have a turn, then you have a turn, that is really going to inform your language behavior, whether you're talking to another adult, to a child, to anybody. And so nice. if you really want to be sure that I have a turn, then you have a turn, you have to wait. You don't have a choice but to wait. Otherwise, you will be the only one talking. <laughs> and we have all been there when we're the only one talking. And that, in fact, is not communication. So it's and really there's a, there's a great quote. Uh, I'll put it. I'll just slip in here from uh, Fran Leibowitz that Mary Sue found online, and uh, I put it into your resource document, folks. It says, "The opposite of talking isn't listening. The opposite of talking is waiting." Oh, So yes. it really reinforces what you're telling us here. It's a beautiful quote. Um, and the thing that we have to remember, and I think can sometimes really be enlightening to re-remember, even for those of us who have worked in communication for a long time, is that mm -hmm. communication boils down to sending and receiving messages. You're sending and you're receiving. It's like a game of catch going back and forth. And so that communication is essential to self-regulation in the way we literally teach the ALERT program by communicating to children, but also, <coughs> excuse me, in the way that we stay in a just right place by handling the just right amount of information. So it's another strategy not only for getting across the concepts of the program, but really allowing the children we're working with to be in the just right place because we're giving them the just right amount of information. So no piling it on. No piling it on. Okay. And how do we know it's the just right amount? We know it because we have back and forth communication. You're really aiming for 50-50, even with a child who's nonverbal, even with a child who doesn't communicate as one, where communication is not one of their strengths. You can always aim for 50-50, back and forth. And I, I love that. And when we were preparing for this call, I was just so jazzed about that because I think a lot of times uh, m many of us can easily make the mistake that because someone is not giving us back words, they don't have the potential to give us back lots of that communication and that 50-50 that you're talking about. So for those of us like myself, we dial it back, wait for the 50-50 part, look at whether we're getting that, and then and then that's our cue as to whether we're giving the just right amount of information Absolutely. and not and not overwhelming, not doing too much, not doing too fast, yeah, all Absolutely. those things. I like to think uh, or say, think ping pong, not dart. Back and forth. <laughs> Back and forth. Oh, that's a quotable that's quote. That's a good one. Think ping yeah. pong, not dark. Yeah. So I love it. 
Well, for those of us who are working or living with individuals who aren't using their words yet, talk to us a little bit about turn-taking strategies that kind of support communication, because I know you have a lot of good information for us there. So true. It is always possible to be reciprocal. That's very exciting to me. Um, that means that we have to change the way we do activities. So, you know, if I'm in a classroom or I'm working with a couple of kids or I'm in home and I want to be reading a book, for example, instead of just reading the book to the child, which maybe you have found is a good activity once they get into a good place with their alertness, they're ready to listen to a book, but you add in the turn-taking. Take turns turning the pages. Take turns pointing to pictures in the book. Take turns opening to any page in the book. Don't have to read it from beginning to end. Don't have to read all the words. Do not have to read all the words. <laughs> for sure. If you're losing your 50-50, quit reading all the words. Um, the child points, the adult labels. Some kids really enjoy that. The adult, nice. the adult reads a familiar phrase and waits for the child to respond with the words or actions or sounds that they know come every time. Um, sometimes when kids engage in activities that they really like, like say building with blocks, and we are very supportive as the therapist or as the parent, and we sit back and we clap for them. Well, we laugh when they knock the blocks down, but instead we take turns putting one on and then the other puts one on. We request a block, either by showing with gestures or saying with words the one that we want. Um, the child's holding the blocks and we have to get them from them or vice versa. So again, these are all, I think, techniques that a lot of therapists use, but we can remind our colleagues, we can help parents to understand, our parents can help us understand right. that that's the way that we can be in a back and forth interaction. And if you're in a back and forth interaction, you can be pretty sure that little person or big person is self-regulated. If you're in a back and forth interaction, you can be pretty sure you're supporting their self-regulation. Oh, those are such lovely and easy examples, and I think many of us see this really naturally in child development, and we have to remember that for so many of our folks, they're just in some of, their, some of those phases of development a little longer, uh, or a lot longer, just depends. But, but what beautiful possibilities, I, I, in my mind, as you were saying about the pointing and the gesturing and that kind of stuff, so when I have my thought bubble that says, Sherry, you might need to be quiet more <laughs> often, it also might say, practice being a mime. But doing, like, you know, and, and, and just right. kind of using my body more to show some of those things and, and the pointing and the gesturing and those things, really lovely, easy examples to be able to add to our repertoire that way if, if you want. And then a fallback career if everything else right, falls exactly. out. Right, so, exactly. Uh, so there we, we always go. Like. That's yeah. right. That's right. Now, even when we aren't specifically teaching alert program content, we really need to be able to observe about self-regulation. Our, our team members, our caregivers need to be able to help us to come together and make choices that will support that individual self-regulation. And I know you had some thoughts on detective work for us that way, Marcy. Absolutely, and one of the things that I and so many other people have learned from you and Mary Sue is the concept of the detective work, that we have to watch and we have to understand what individuals are communicating to us about their self-regulation. So that detective work is sense to communication too. Watching right. and learning the signals that show us where a child is and what they need to support their self-regulation. So an, an individual might talk more, or they might talk less when they need self-regulation support. Mm -hmm. So in the case of somebody who's really running high, and they're just talking, 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 and they're losing the reciprocity or the back and forth communication, there's a signal. They need something that's going to help them to calm down. When we have a talk less, that means or a person who's talking less, all of a sudden they're just not participating very much, they're not talking as much as they sometimes do, there's a signal we might need um, intervention to help them calm up, as right. I know that you guys often talk about. So it helps us to understand. Some of our individuals vocalize more when they're in a self-regulated place, and it can be a beautiful way to notice that they're just more present with their vocalizing or their verbalizing. Um, if you're doing a movement activity, you can add the reciprocity by taking turns moving. If you have an end product, like we sometimes like to do, we move first and then we do something like a puzzle afterwards, you can take turns putting the pieces back and forth to keep that communication going so the individual that you're working with knows it's always going to be about back and forth. It's never going to be just a one-way street. And, that, and that's a great example because the puzzle and those end products, uh, those of you that know our, our, our work or know a lot about self-regulation and using heavy work activities is very often we're going to need, when we do heavy work, the pushing, the pulling, the tugging, the towing, the big movement, big body movements. That's great and it's helpful in terms of regulation. 
and it can cause escalation without those end product pieces. So we kind of described end products as things that require a little slow down, a moment of focus, a moment of coming together and using your skills, and then getting up and doing some more heavy work. So kind of uh, incorporating all of that together as we do so often in, in uh, joint therapy or in uh, a lot of our home activity kind of things, uh, gonna be so important there. And, and many of us as therapists, this is very automatic to us, but the, the, I think the great thing about the reminder here is that we may be automatic when we do it in our therapy, articulating that to other people, right. telling our parents what we're doing and why and how easy that can be uh, is, is going to be so important. So um, talk to us a little bit about some of the observing that way. Well, and one of the best ways to observe, which also matches with a great language teaching strategy, is imitation. So oh, when sure. we do what they like to do with their bodies, for example, or with their communication, we have to pay really close attention or we won't know what to do. If we're trying to imitate, mm -hmm. we really have to watch. And we promote back and forth communication because they are most likely to imitate us when we imitate them. And that's a really fun thing to see when you do it. And then we can expand on what they do. So when we figure out awesome. what's self-regulating, for example, jumping, we can expand on that activity and have even more reciprocal interactions. <laughs> make everybody happy. And there we go. Keep at it, keep at it. And that's such a good point because the, the child, when a child doesn't have language yet, it's easy for the team to be confused about self-regulation. And here's our moment. This is it. We get to be a team and do those great detective work pieces that you described, the observation, the image. And what do we get when we have in, incorporate imitation, all those pieces? Um, let's see, we, uh, we talked a little bit about, uh, I, I'm actually going to kind of skip to some other information that I wanted to make sure that we got to cover here, because uh, Marcy, you and I can just be talking all day we long here, but, um, but one of the things is that um, self-regulation kind of sets us up to be able to uh, up receive and apply what it is that we're learning. So um, talk a little bit about some misconceptions, when, oh, I, I kind of skipped ahead here, because really we want, what I wanted to say is that a lot of people have conceptions about teaching language and that, and that uh, you know, it's only when we sit at a table and it has to have a ton of structure and all that kind of stuff. So talk a little bit about that to us, or for us, with us. Yeah. Uh, you can see I'm struggling <laughs> at this moment. Evidently, I need a little self-regulation. Definitely. Um, yeah, I think it's really important there can be kind of a line drawn in the sand between people who are interested in applied behavior analysis, which is just very structured ways of teaching, and people who are interested in <laughs> sensory motor type learning and more um, developmental approaches and you know right and it doesn't ha it, the, un I think the unfortunate part you and I've been fortunate to be around a lot of people who know both very very well and absolutely. it really should be a blend not a either or or a versus or whatever absolutely it's such an easy blend so yeah. when you think about structured ways of teaching language they're great and when they're well done what's sometimes referred to as applied behavior analysis or ABA it means that your therapy or your interaction with your child is based on a clear assessment of what the child can do, under what circumstances, and then knowing what's fabulously reinforcing for them. So there shouldn't be a Great. power struggle because this learning is just, it's in the just right place for what they're ready to learn and then it's very reinforcing. What's important though is that that learning always has to be applied to back and forth conversation. Always, always, always. It's never enough to learn something across the table and never apply it to actual communication because if there's no sending and receiving messages out in the world, you're actually not teaching communication. That's what we know. And we also know, and we're talking about today, that back and forth conversation needs self-regulated communicators. And meaningful communication promotes self-regulation. So we're all in cahoots. Oh, my gosh. All, it could really almost go together, it, couldn't it? Can it could almost work. Exactly. So, you know, there could be those misconceptions that sitting at a table naming pictures is the only way to teach the use of language. And talking about just that one example of naming pictures, um, if you have decided or the therapists or the evaluators or whoever feel like learning to name pictures is really important for that child's learning, and it okay. might be, yeah. um, then we have to look at the self-regulation factor. So we have the potential to sit at a table and work at naming pictures and then have movement between each picture that's named. So period of movement followed by period of focus followed by period of movement. It's a great way right, to go. Right, right. On the other hand, we might get a little bold and place the pictures <laughs> around the room. Same oh my. pictures. Oh my. Place them around the room and then the child is moving and naming. And you know, on, in another time, in another conversation, we could talk more about how that movement is actually going to facilitate their ability to pull out that name and, and remember what, it, what an object is called. 
Right. So this type of activity, running over to get the picture and naming it, might be reinforcing enough. But if we need something more tangible, if that child just hasn't had a lot of fun experiences with moving or with naming, then we might have to look for a really strong and meaningful reinforcer that will increase the likelihood that they will participate again. So we don't want to get offended that there's some kind of a food used or there's some kind of a sticker used, that that's not natural. It's just helping the child learn, oh, when I do this, this really feels good to my body, and this really helps me communicate better. And and I want to come back for more. And I, I want to do stay it again. With you on exactly. And what right. so many of us have found is that when we have good self regulation supports and meaningful activity, in and of itself, it will become a wonderful reinforcer. And so that's just bonus at that point, that's right? That's so bonus. then we've worked our behavior and uh, information, and we've worked our sensory motor Absolutely. information. So that is very, very cool. Um, Marcy, you and I, when we were planning, talked about some cardinal rules that we felt were important to address. Uh, and um, and I thought uh, I'll admit to breaking many of these, but go ahead and give us a couple of cardinal rules, if you would. Absolutely. We, if we hadn't been breaking them, they wouldn't be cardinal rules. So <laughs> that's for sure. That's true. <laughs> Here's my favorite cardinal rule. So first, number one, more or louder doesn't help. Unfortunately, <laughs> we think it will, but it doesn't. So I always think of the example. Many of us have been on a restaurant in a restaurant or on an airplane, and you know, basically, if a person, um, a patron in that restaurant, is not an English speaker and they don't understand what's being said, talking louder doesn't actually help. Do you want coffee or tea? No. <laughs> they don't understand the words. It will not be helpful. We didn't understand it the first time. We still yeah, don't understand it with the volume turned not. up. Okay. So it's, you know, you, it's so natural for us to do it. So I it's know. a cardinal rule. More or louder doesn't help. You've got to be at the level where that child can understand you at their moment in time, given their self-regulation. That's what will help. Nice. Avoid repeating verbal directions. Oh, this is what? a hard one. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't. I just. I couldn't stop myself. If the individual heard it, I mean, if you think they absolutely didn't even know you were talking to them, perhaps you could repeat one time. But if the individual heard it and needs time, or the direction was too complex, then it's not going to help to say it again. So when we say, "Do you want swing or puzzle?" we stop and we wait and we're gentle. And if we don't think that they can process those words in that moment, we might gently prompt them by showing them a little closer what those two choices are, or even gently moving their hand toward one or the other so they can show us yes or no. But if you follow this rule, you'll be amazed. And in classrooms, this is just critical. Sometimes in classrooms, we have great teachers, and then we have great educational assistants, and the teacher says one thing, and then the educational assistant repeats it from across the room because they're just trying to help. Right, so right. So no, once we stop repeating directions, environment's quiet, and better, better processing for everyone. So even well-intentioned repeating, Oh uh, yeah. not really. It, it, we'll go back to your lives and see what happens when you stop repeating. It's oh, very, very exciting. Cool. Um, and then keep it simple. The use of complex language actually often decreases the chance for comprehension. So it's, it's, it's remembering that we want to talk kind of at the same level or communicate with our bodies at the same level that a child communicates, and then maybe just use a little bit more. And we talked, Marcy, uh, those are great cardinal rules. We also talked about a rule that is so very important, uh, and tell us a little bit about sensory overload and what your rule for that would be in communication. Here. That's just such an important one, too. So when a child, when an individual has gotten past the point of no return, for whatever reason they've really gone into a sensory overloaded state, they're having what we sometimes refer to as a meltdown right. or a total withdrawal, then, believe it or not, the cardinal rule is, no talking, none, zero. You stop talking entirely because no language will now be processed. That includes explaining why they need to change their behavior, threatening, which I'm sorry to say we probably all have done in a moment when we're <laughs> Guilty just, as charged. just hitting the wall or begging, please, please come play this game. It'll be so much fun. <laughs> this is just such a common mistake, but there's no auditory processing happening when we're in sensory overload that can look like meltdown or shutdown. And there's just no learning happening. And so that's when we back off and give that nervous system a chance to get in the just right place. Nice. And wow, what an important reminder. It's so tempting. It's so, it's so tough when the meltdown is occurring, and yet we're really going to try to stick with it and, and uh, give it a good go there, Marcy, learning from what you've told us. I want to fit in, I know we're getting close to our time here, but I want to fit in just two uh, kind of great questions that we had from uh, folks. Um, so the first one, Marcy, was uh, if I as an adult don't use language, how will the individual learn to use language? And I thought this was such a great question. It's a great question and one that comes up real frequently. 
we, what we want to remember is that we're using communication that's at a level that's similar to but slightly above the level of the child. So if they nice. point generally to get their message across and say a word, I mean, rather, if they point, then we point too, and then we say a word. So we're saying, oh, you point, and I get that, but here's a way you could try later on when you're ready to say a word. If they use one word, we use two, and so on. Sometimes this is called the one-up rule. It's just a natural language teaching strategy that we know that we use with individuals who are developing their language typically, but now we bring more specific attention to it for children who are struggling to learn language. If they use a sentence but it's kind of a simple sentence, we're not going to go into a big, long, complicated sentence. We're showing them that we can communicate in a way that they can understand, but also we're showing them how they might try communicating next. And that's really nice because uh, we, we, we talked a little bit about this, and it's the as the adults, we're doing the one-up. We're not necessarily expecting the one-up from the right. child. And that was a really nice distinction when you and I were talking about that. So we're modeling what could happen in the future, but allowing them to respond in the way that they have now uh, to be able to show and interact with us. Absolutely. And then the second question I'm going to go ahead and take a little bit here. It said, how does the ALERT program affect the ability to understand language? And Obviously, uh, when our nervous system is set up to be able to process uh, at its best, of course we'll be able to process easier, more efficiently, understand better, uh, and be able to apply that information or that understanding better. So for instance, I'll give a simple example just on myself, that if I were wanting to talk with someone and to attend to their conversation, and I, so I'm motivated, I, I do want to do this, right? But there's a radio on in the background, and, and it may be at a, a volume that's interfering with my ability to stay in and participate uh, in the conversation. So what might happen is I may have more trouble answering as fully as I would like to. I may have trouble being a good turn taker. I may not be thinking as clearly as I'd like to, or I might not get, I might get most of the content but miss an important piece of it. And so when we think of that radio as extra input, like in the listen category, for instance, in the alert program, uh, it isn't a match for my engine in this situation. But in another time, the radio in the background could be a perfect engine support. So it's so specific to what we want, what to, we want to accomplish, what we're trying to do at the time, and what's going on, obviously, in our environments. So taking all those pieces into consideration is going to be so important. So I want to uh, end with a quotable quote from you, Marcy, that sums up uh, what we're going for here, which is reciprocal communication. If we're getting reciprocal communication, we will be at the right language level. This is like aha for me. Absolutely. So I can take the pressure off as an OT and not be worried. If I'm getting my reciprocal, I know I've got the right uh, language level. So, uh, and I know you have uh, strong feelings on that one uh, uh, there uh, that you'd like to share. Absolutely, with and it's just you know it is my favorite topic because I think it is so pertinent to everything that we do and what it means to have relationships, which Sherry started out by telling us are the basis of all learning. Really? And in fact, I have often challenged people when I've had the opportunity to talk to groups to think of a single problem in the whole wide world, and heaven knows today we are thinking about some problems pretty close to home. Lots so plenty um, of world problems that need solving, so yes. if this but is going to know, contribute to it, let's go. You know, thinking of any problem, can you think of a problem that couldn't be solved by back and forth communication? I really believe there are no problems that could not be solved by our ability, by an increased ability to communicate back and forth with one another and by practicing this with the children that we work with and live with every day, we're making a real difference in the world. It's so big and so huge, and thank you for taking this much time to stay with uh, with me and talk uh, about it. Uh, we can all go forth and do the important work of the world by supporting that reciprocal communication. So as we conclude here, and I know we went a couple of minutes over, I think we were managed to keep it simple. You gave lovely, beautiful, easy examples that we can use ourselves and share with others so that we basically then will do our other piece, which is set folks up for success uh, in their in all their endeavors of life. Uh, thanks again, Marcy, for joining Thank me. I you. just always, always learn. I, I enjoy uh, these times together, and they always zip by so quickly. So Thank I apologize you. that we're a moment or two over. Uh, if you liked this format, then check out some of our upcoming calls uh, and on the, our website, and then feel free to check out any of the recorded calls that we have going. Uh, if anything that we said here uh, in the call doesn't fit, isn't a match, trust your judgment, don't do it. You deserve to get professional help, and do that if you need to. Um, we're, I think we're ready to wrap it up here. Thanks so much for your time. Have a great night. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.